there's a concern that this is an alcohol issue when in reality what we're campaigning for is not, not extension of drinking areas but, but of entertainment. What I think what will drive this now is business and enterprise and protecting the thousands of jobs that have been lost and the boost that this industry needs. My name is Fintan Warfield. I became active in politics uh, when I was 16. It's been a privilege to be involved in politics over the last 10 years. We've seen really significant change, repeal, marriage equality, campaigning for licensing, law reform. You know, it's been a great pleasure to be involved in those campaigns. I'm Sunil Sharp. I'm a DJ, a teacher. I make music and I'm part of the Give Us the Night campaign, a campaign that has been pushing to change Irish nightlife for more years than I care to mention at this point. But it's, um, it's been an ongoing campaign and then in the last few years we've given it a renewed push uh, to, to where we are now. I think before I met you, I had a desire for change in terms of nightlife but I didn't see what was possible because there wasn't a, a campaign, a formal campaign mm. around which I could get behind as a politician. And for so many years, you know, when I was mayor or when I was running for election, we were going to a club and going to Mother, opposite City Hall, you know, all these places where we'd meet people and we'd have engaging conversations about the city that we lived in. Um, and I didn't feel like I had a body of work or, you know, proposals that I could get behind as a, as a political public representative. And I remember we ran, Sinn Féin ran a, uh, an event for the LGBT community in Outhouse and Una Mullally asked what he's doing about nightlife. And I, I said, God, you know, you, you've come to me about a couple of weeks before, before I'm ready on this because uh, I was aware now there was a campaign called Give Us the Night. I think we met shortly after the first event in the Sugar Club. And, and that was around the time that people were saying, oh, what's the next big social issue? What are the next big social issues that we're going to deal with, repeal? But no one was talking about nightlife reform or the night economy. And there was probably there were probably more people at, at that early stage of that of that campaign than I've seen at any early stage of any of the big referendum campaigns. Yeah, I mean that's it's good to hear. I mean I remember you stood up that day and or that night at least, and um, we also spoke in general that night about the underage gigs or non-alcoholic gigs. We talked about kind of kind of breaking the, the cycle of what we've had for since God knows when. The idea that events could go ahead um, and involve just more of the community in ways that we maybe haven't done or championed in the past. I think when it comes to nightlife, a lot of the focus tends to begin and end with alcohol. It's, and I think that's something we really wanted to change when we properly relaunched. So just as a background to that, part of the reason it, we went quiet for a while was because my own DJ career was taken off. And I had to make decisions at that point back in 2011, 2012, when I was getting booked to play outside of Ireland on a, a regular basis, because it's like, right, do I, do I push behind this campaign where some of the main stakeholders and even nightclub owners themselves are actually undermining us. I, I, I kind of saw it for what it was, and it's about timing. And for, for, for me, I could see that the time was not right. The, the nightclub industry at the time were not getting very far. We definitely weren't going to push it on our own at that point either. So what changed, roll on to 2019, what changed at the point that you had a packed sugar club and a whole grassroots campaign? presented a whole lot of activists. Yeah, I think it was 20, it was actually probably started 20, at, at the, near the end of 2017. So I'd sent a submission to the Justice Department and for once I didn't get their usual um, piece of piece of paper in the letter in the in the post saying we got your submission and that's it you know it wouldn't go any further than that but usually you'd at least get that and we didn't get it this time and I was like I wonder what what's what, what's happening there so I contacted them and they said oh yeah we didn't get us but maybe send it in again and just at that point I realized to myself I'm, I, I'm just fooling myself here. We're not, gonna, we're not gonna get very far doing this. And I gotta say, I probably was inspired by what was happening with, um, with repeal and um, the marriage equality campaigns and the fact that, the, the, that younger people are now becoming a lot more politically engaged than they had done in the past. And I've always known this is a youth issue as well. At the beginning of 2018, I just thought, well, 
there's, there's only one way to do this. We need to relaunch this campaign properly and it needs new blows, new voices, new ideas. It can't be just me and if whoever is willing to help at the time to kind of who generally would have been older members of the campaign at that point who wouldn't still have the time. We need a new blood. And I think I, I kind of called a public meeting, I think, at the beginning of 2018, which was in uh, the Grand Social. My experience of raising the issue in the Oireachtas is uh, eye-opening because you're obviously dealing with a whole lot of people who have never experienced a dance hall, despite legislating, amending dance hall acts, despite amending regulations if they're in government. Um, and often there'll be laughter or um, snide comments about, you know, when you raise, when I raise issues ar uh, around nightlife. My experience of going out clubbing is the experience of meeting people who you won't agree with. You'll have debate in the smoking areas. You'll, you'll be at parties after, you know, talking about the issues of the day, basically. Um, and these are intergenerational conversations and intergenerational spaces as well. In a time like this, that's why the GAA is so important. That's why clubbing is so important. When people are work, working at home, uh, we're on our screens all of the time, uh, and our only interaction with people who we might never meet, depending on class or background or whatever, uh, our only interaction might be out socialising. And we've been, you know, people drink at, people drank at home, uh, still drink at home, obviously during the pandemic. But doesn't it say a lot that people are bored of drinking at home? And doesn't it show that we don't go out to drink but that we go out to meet people and to socialise and to have those conversations. And, um, you know, one response when I recently raised it in the Shannon was that, you know, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm past that age now, you know, which is a shame because they're not actually past that age. And this does apply. It is a young issue, you've mentioned that, but it does apply to a whole lot of different age groups. How would you feel if your, if your club, if your GAA club was demolished, you know, next week? How, what, how would you feel about that? And that place for you and your, your friends and community to come together wasn't there anymore. And that's what we've experienced in Ireland and in Dublin particularly in recent times and that our clubs have, have actually been knocked down. I think there's a lot of promoters even and a lot of DJs and musicians who are still involved in music but don't necessarily spend as much time at the club or venue anymore. And I think once you can appreciate that there is that core group who are that little bit younger, it's, you know, it's, it's just been a bit more appreciative and, and respectful that these type of clubs are as valuable to people People in the music community as they are to people in the JAA community, for instance. And this is very much about the pitch, isn't it? You know, this is about if it's if you're talking to someone who relates to the JAA club, you'll, you'll talk about that. When we had uh, Give Us the Night in to the Oireachtas Committee on Arts and Culture, it was about this is about artists living, you know, this is about the cultural sector being able to thrive. This, this is a measure that doesn't cost any money for once. You know, we're not asking for money for the arts. We're asking just for rules to be changed and you'll create jobs and you'll support an industry. You know, we're moving toward post-pandemic situation. Um, we have a, an industry on its absolute knees. It's the uh, first to close and last to reopen. Um, we, need, we need change now that supports the hospitality industry. In your, in your, how many years have you been doing this? Is that, uh, is, is the pandemic the thing that's going to? Yes and no, because I think a lot of the commitments were made before the pandemic became what we know to be today. At the beginning of, of us, a lot of people felt that it might last for three months, maybe four months, maybe six months, but not much longer than that. So when a lot of the decisions were being made around the programme for government and the wording was being put in and eventually the task force was being put together, that was really in the early stages of the, of the pandemic. I feel actually that some of the, we could be further down the line, further down the track with this uh, than we are now were it not for the pandemic. On the other hand, I think the ambition that is there now is, is different in terms of what we do long term. So I think what, it, what they're aiming for now is 
is a is a is a is not just a quick fix. It's a it's a broader conversation now. It affects more than just nightclubs and late night venues. It affects it affects restaurants, pubs. It affects anyone in in the licensed trade. And then of course like um, art centres and theatres and any kind of space that can be used for entertainment at night. The good health of nighttime venues has a knock on effect to those venues and how they operate during the day as well. Are they going to be still here in a year? You know, and by by having a more flexible system, I think it will make it a lot easier for venues to plan into the future and just be a bit more ambitious with what they do. So what have you experienced in other countries in terms of with extended time to what we have now? I know in some places I'm it conditioned be... to go home. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> at a certain era, so I probably uh, we we probably would have left. I can't dance for that long either. I just can't. Yeah. Like Stephen could dance all night, yeah. but I I get tired and you know. We, we hit the road at a time, you know, three or four, you know. When, when a place closes in Dublin, you either have a party in the house or people sometimes go to organise parties that are not, you know, not always the safest places to be. Um, you know, journalists have written about them, unregulated spaces, you know. <laughs> if that's an issue, if clearly there's a demand for, for people to, to party on past the regulated hours, we need to address it. We need to have spaces that are legal and regulated and are safe, where we can, you know, properly distribute harm reduction information about uh, drink and drugs. Um, we need to utilise our city, plan our city better. Um, and, and this measure, I think, and, and your campaign and the Give Us a Night campaign is, is so important for Dublin, for Ireland. Um, and there's such a demand now for it. There's an unstoppable demand for, for this change. Yeah, I agree. I think it's going that way. I don't think anything can really stop it now. And I think everyone sort of signed off on it to an extent. Definitely in Dublin anyway. I think there's challenges down outside of Dublin. I don't think all of the operators, for instance, want the same things outside of Dublin as they want in Dublin at the moment. I mean, it's, I'm not trying to judge because I think anyone that's left in the industry now and any of the operators that I've spoken to, there's some, um, you know, they've been doing something right to be in business this long. But we've also lost a lot of really key operators and clubs over the years. Um, and part of the reason was because there wasn't that flexibility and also because some of them just didn't, they didn't want the competition. They didn't want to push behind the change that we needed over a decade ago. We needed a long time ago. So at one point we had over 500 nightclubs in Ireland. Now we have under 100, you know, and actually on that on that point, do you think Dublin needs a directly elected mayor? I personally don't think Dublin needs a mayor for the night because this is a problem that should have been addressed by the politicians that we have mm -hmm. uh, and it can be addressed and I don't, I don't see, personally I don't see a, a need uh, for a mayor of the night. If, if that's a demand that exists, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I would never stand in its way. Yeah. Um, but I think Dublin does need a directly elected mayor, absolutely. We are talking a lot about nighttime economy, and at the moment that role seems to be kind of being forged into this nighttime economy advisor role, which I think would be really positive. I would just wonder how it would work. I think there's a lot of people that are against somebody getting paid for that. Yeah. But also, we can't rely on campaigners all of the time. We can't rely on people to continue to tell their own stories. We can't rely on individuals who just get burnt out. Mm. Uh, so uh, elected reps and Dublin City Council and other councils need to take responsibility for half of the time uh, around yeah. the clock, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there's a lot more that could be um, that could be expanded in terms of the cultural remit of Dublin City Council. You know, I think a lot of culture in Dublin tends to end at at six or seven o'clock. It's 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 tea and biscuit culture, as, uh, as far as I can see, is you know, which is great. You know what I mean? It's great to think that there's places for your for your grandparents or for others to be able to go to during the day, and there's places like 14 Henrietta Street. I also feel there's a lot of other buildings that could be used for cultural use involving music that would go later into the night. I was amazed at the response from the representative from the Department of Justice the day give us the night. Uh, came into the the Oireachtas Committee on Culture. Yeah. Um, I, I just couldn't, I was just thrilled with the response and the positivity that we saw from the department representative that day. But this is an issue that falls across so many, like there's transport because we need to get to and from places and 
and public transport needs to be open 24 hours in order for this to be workable. There's justice who control the license in law. There's health because, you know, there's a concern that this is an alcohol uh, issue when in reality what we're campaigning for is not, not extension of drinking hours but, uh, but of entertainment. Uh, but what I think what will drive this now is business and enterprise and protecting the thousands of jobs that have been lost um, and the boost that this industry needs. I think it, and yet another uh, department, business and enterprise, comes into the, comes into the picture. Uh, and I think they're the ones that will really drive this, um, drive the reform that we need. Yeah, and also, I mean, I think there's a large part of the workforce as well, especially like foreign nationals, um, students, those who, who can rely on the nighttime industry for work, as well as, as well as those who've been working in the industry and those who have, have um, certain skills that they've built up. A lot of people don't always consider them, you know, they don't consider that they have families and mortgages and bills to pay. It's like the person you mentioned earlier in the, in, in the doll or whatever, in the Shannons, who kind of laughs off nightlife but how can you laugh off nightlife when there's people that that work in those in that industry and once those venues shut they're unemployed you know what do they do then you know you're about to drop the report um from the task force um i, I just want to say that it's going to be a huge hugely valuable piece of work for me as a someone as a parliamentarian uh, in the oroctus uh, to hold government to account to i I know we'll see this change. Um, there's no other option, and there's a huge demand for it. And I just want to thank you, um, uh, to thank Robbie Kitt, to thank all of the campaigners around. Give us the night. You know you've made an extraordinary contribution, and and it's come at you know personal sacrifice as well. So just to say thanks. Oh, thank, thanks, thanks a lot, Fintan. I mean, it's a, it's a team effort, like you said. It is something that will continue on for a while. We're not fully there yet, but definitely the commitment from the, the minister and her department and the government has been positive, but there's still a bit of time to go. This, this report will, will definitely set out a plan and then it's just about holding the, holding the government accountable then. And I think they need to prioritise this. I've, I've no doubt that they want to do it, but we need to ensure that they prioritise it now and that we finally just get this over the line, so yeah.